So why don't you turn in your Bibles to, to the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark. We're going to go to the New Testament this morning. And it feels a little weird to be in the New Testament. We've been in the Old Testament uh, for quite some time. Um, before we begin, I want to introduce myself. My name is Patrick. I'm one of the servant leaders here at, the, at Cornerstone Bible Church. And if I haven't met you, I just want to say hello and, and greet you. Uh, so I'd, like, I'd love to be able to meet with you for a little bit afterwards. But this morning, we are looking at the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark. We're going to read 17 to 31, a very familiar passage. And I hope to explain this text and apply this text that Christ would receive all glory and honor. So why don't you read with me and take your copy of God's Word as we read verses 17 to 31. Chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. If I didn't say that. Mark chapter 10. The rich young ruler... Verse 17, and as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and began asking him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, Do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. And looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess And give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But at these words, his face fell, and he went away grieved, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were even more astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Looking upon them, Jesus said, With men... It is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake but that he shall receive a hundred times as much now in the present age. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms along with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last. And the last first. Let's pray. Father, We give you thanks for your word. I pray that you would take this word that we have read and seal it upon our hearts as we look to it and try to discern and understand the meaning of it, of why this text at this time in the ministry of Jesus, in this particular place, with this particular man, and the particular words, the specific words that Jesus gives to this man. Oh God, I pray for visitors and guests and those that are here that are part of this church, that you would encourage them from your word. That you would take this word and help us to see that Christ is our all-sufficient treasure. That he is the one worth living for. So be with us now as we look at this text and, and, and consider where we stand before you. Where, where are we in our 
relationship with you. Maybe we have been playing around with you. Oh, I pray that this text this morning would pierce our hearts and expose in our hearts things that we have yet to see, that it would take your law to expose it. So, Father, be with me. Help me to explain your word. Help me to preach. And so that they would hear your voice and not mine. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are in Mark's gospel, the gospel of Mark. And really, in this part of Mark's gospel, Jesus has left Judea and is moving towards the southern region down all the way to Jerusalem. He's on a journey making his way down to Jerusalem. And in his journey, he's always taking with him his disciples. So the point of the journey is not just to travel, but to also teach the disciples. And he is providing avenues for discipleship. He's using every opportunity to disciple the twelve, those that are with him. And in this section, the focus that Jesus is showing is what it means to be a disciple of Christ. What does it mean to be a disciple? And he shows what it means to be a disciple in three ways. He shows that he uses three illustrations to show what does it mean or what does it take to be a true disciple. He uses marriage as an example in chapter 10, verses 1 to 12. And then he uses children in verses 13 to 16. And then he uses treasure in verses 17 to 31. Now, if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. He uses marriage as a picture of commitment that's necessary to be a disciple of Christ. You must be committed, so there's this picture of marriage. It seems that he's being attacked, but he uses it as an opportunity to teach that to be a follower of Christ, you must be committed. And then the children come in verses 13 to 16, and a true disciple is one who is dependent upon God, just like a child is dependent completely upon parents or his father or his mother. There is no entrance into the kingdom unless you become like a child. And then lastly, our passage in verses 17 to 31, to be a true disciple, you must have Christ as your ultimate treasure. You cannot have two treasures of the world and of Christ. And so this morning we're going to look at that section, 17 to 31. And the title this morning for the message is The Cost and Reward of Becoming a Christian. Oftentimes we only talk about the cost. And we hit that pretty hard. But here in this text, Jesus speaks of a cost and also of a reward of what it means to become a Christian. So the outline is really three parts. It's pretty straightforward. There is an unexpected question in verses 17 to 20. And then there is an unbelievable response in verses 21 to 27. And then there is the unimaginable treasure in verses 28 to 31. And the point of the passage is to show the great cost and great reward of becoming a Christian. And maybe that's where you are today. You're wondering, am I a Christian? Or maybe you're wondering, I am a Christian. I've spent so much for the Lord. I feel like I've sacrificed so much. What do I get in return? Or what will I have? Where's my treasure? You may be wondering. So this text, I think, is for all of us this morning. Whether you are on the fence and wondering, you have been coming to church and wondering, am I truly a Christian? How do I know if I truly am a Christian? So first let's begin with the, the, in verse 17 where we meet and the unexpected question. The unexpected question. The passage begins with Jesus reminding the reader that he is on a journey. It says in verse 17, and he was setting out on a journey a journey towards Jerusalem. And we know that Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem to be killed. And we'll look at that part of the text later on. But the focus in this opening verse in 17 is something odd takes place. There's a, an unexpected question. There's a man that comes up to him and he says he runs up to him and he kneels before him and he asks him this question, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life. That's an odd, odd situation. No one has ever ran up to Jesus 
asking not just uh, a theological question, a question about marriage, but the ultimate question. And so here's this man. And one, one thing we can observe is that he's a troubled man. He's troubled. He's coming to Jesus, not for healing, not to cast demons out of someone in his family, not to ask food, but he's troubled in his spirit. He's asking this one spiritual need. He has this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's troubled. There's trouble in his soul. He's asking the ultimate question. But not only is he troubled, he is sincere. He's not playing games. He's not trying to trap Jesus like the Pharisees. He's not trying to ask Jesus about how many wives will this man have when he gets to heaven when he dies. He's not trying to trap Jesus. He's going for a sincere answer to his question. And notice the sincerity of this man because he runs. He runs. I don't know if you've noticed, but ancient Near East people, they do not run. There is no jogging that takes place in the Middle East. This is a culture of shame and honor. Men who wear robes do not run because, first of all, they have sandals. They don't have, like, running shoes. They don't jog. This is a dishonorable thing to do, to actually run, run around. The only one other runner that I can think of in the New Testament would probably be the prodigal son's father who ran to the son. And every time there's a running that takes place in a non-running society, you should be thinking, why is he running? This is odd that this man would run in a non-running society. And furthermore, this man, what we learn from him is in Matthew 19 and Luke, or in Luke 18 and Matthew 19, that this man was a ruler of some kind. So he's a man of prestige. He is so desperate and so sincere about his question that he's going straight to Jesus and does not care what other people think. Remember the one other ruler of Israel who was wanting to ask Jesus a question but was kind of ashamed and he went at night? The first Nick at night? Nicodemus? He goes to Jesus at night asking him a question, afraid of what maybe people might think. But this man, he goes straight up to Jesus. Doesn't, he doesn't care what people think. He's a man full of sincerity. He's the kind of guy you want. The kind of man that you want full of sincerity who's troubled in his spirit. He's the perfect man that you want to speak the gospel to and, and, and with. Not only is he troubled, not only is he sincere, but he is also respectful. He's respectful. He approaches Jesus and notice what he does. He kneels before Jesus. He's probably a tall man. And so when you approach someone of superiority, you would probably kneel because it would be kind of weird to talk to someone and look down at them with respect. So this man probably knelt down and asked Jesus this question, good teacher, what shall I do? What shall I do? And he approaches Jesus with respect by calling him good teacher. Now, most men do not kneel before other men and most Jewish men also do not call other Jewish men no matter even rabbis, good teacher. That's probably the most unusual part of this, is this man is loosely calling Jesus good teacher. Good teacher. He is calling him good. He's calling him with this word that describes Jesus as intrinsically good. He's evaluated Jesus. He's observed Jesus from afar, and he's made the conclusion, this man is good. And out of everyone, I need to ask this one good man the ultimate question, which is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This man is asking the most important question. Have you ever met anyone like this? Have you ever talked to anyone off the street, talked to someone in your own family, maybe in people that have come out to a, an event, a preaching event comes up, uh, uh, takes place, a visitor comes up, up to you and says to you, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I have been a Christian long enough, no one ever comes up to me and says to me, just tell me plainly, what do I need to do to be a Christian? It seems that if there is one 
opportunity for Jesus to explain the gospel, this would be it. You have this man who's coming ripe. He's the kind of fish you want to catch. He is the perfect model for the one who is so hungry. He is what the world would call a seeker. And he's coming. And he's coming right up to Jesus asking the question. And he's asking the question, what must I do? If I were to tell you, hey, someone just went up to me and he is asking me this question about what, what do I need to do to become a Christian? You would probably respond to me and say, wait a minute, whoa. You mean you didn't have to prove that God exists? Wait, you, you mean you didn't have to tell him that the Bible is true? Wait, 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 you mean you, you didn't have to tell him about he's a sinful man and, and that he needs, there's a life after? You didn't have to do any of that? No, he just asked me, what do I have to do to have eternal life? This is that man. None of those things were necessary. He just went straight for the ultimate question. What must I do? But there's a problem with this question, isn't there? There's a problem with this question. There's a flaw in this man's question. Because he says this, What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? What must I do? Now this is in sharp contrast to the other group of people that Jesus just spoke about. Remember right before this, right before this passage, Jesus speaks to the disciples about the children. About the children. In sharp contrast, in the previous verses, in verses 13 to 16, this man did not understand the kingdom of God as a gift. And the one who enters it must be in complete Humility must be completely humble in order to enter the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus said in verse 15, Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child, that is to say, in absolute and in complete dependence, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I think that is probably the most common view today. When you ask someone about heaven, they always ask, well, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? Just tell me, what do I need to do? How much money do I need to give? How much good works must I do? How much sin do I have to repent from? How much good do I have to actually do? And how much of God's word do I have to read? How much of God's law do I have to obey? How much emotion do I need to have? How many tears must I shed? We go through the whole gamut, but if you whittle it all down, it boils down to, what must I do? What must I do? Instead of asking the question like a child, I can do nothing. I can do nothing. This man says, no, I need to do something. I want to be in charge. What must I do to be saved? And so now Jesus asks a series of questions to expose this man's faulty view of God, his faulty view of his self, and his faulty view of salvation. And so Jesus starts prodding and asking questions to expose his faulty and deficient view of salvation, his deficient view of God, and his deficient view of his own spiritual condition. Look at verse 18. Look at what Jesus says. First of all, is this how you would answer this question? Man just comes up to you. Look at what Jesus says. Jesus is actually troubled by this man. He says in verse 18, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Why would Jesus say that? Why would, have you noticed? Why would Jesus say, Why do you call me good? Is Jesus dodging the question? Is Jesus, did he have a brain freeze and forgot how a person is going to inherit salvation? Is Jesus stumped? No, Jesus is exposing a fundamental flaw in this man's view. This man is basically, Jesus is saying to this man, hold up, do you know who I am? Do you actually know who I am? Do you know what you're saying, friend, about me? Because apparently this man is using the word good randomly. He's probably spoken to many of the other Jewish leaders and calling them good teacher, good teacher, good teacher. And Jesus is saying, wait a minute, don't call any man good. There is none good but God alone. 
Jesus is not saying he's not good, or, nor is Jesus saying he's not God, but he's saying be careful with the way you use the word good. Don't be so loose with this phrase good. It's too loose. The only one that is good is God. And I think we have the same problem today. When you ask someone, why is it that you think you're going to go to heaven? What do most people say? I'm pretty good. Or if they're humble, they will say, well, I am good enough. Sign of humility. Really, the fundamental flaw is we think of good as something that is relative. I am good in comparison to that guy right there. I'm better than him or that woman. I'm better than her. So when we think of good, it's all in relative terms. But when God is saying good, it's absolute. There's only one who is good, and it is God. And so Jesus is trying to show, don't use that word good. It is not a relative term. It's an absolute term. And there is only one who is good. That phrase good should be reserved for God and God alone. Now look at verse 19. Jesus goes further. Now that he's exposed this man's faulty view of God and goodness and his view of man as being capable of good, he exposes him further by asking him a series of questions. In verse 19, he shows the deficiency of his own self-deception by going into the commandments. He's using the law. He says in verse 19, you know the commandments. He's telling the young man, you know the commandments. Come on. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. And then, honor your father and mother. Jesus is showing him a list of the, of the Ten Commandments, but he doesn't give him the whole ten. He gives him the one in the middle. The ones in the middle. The ones that are relating to each other. Because if you remember the Ten Commandments, the first four are about loving God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, having no graven images, having not taken the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath. Those four are about loving God. And then the latter half are about loving neighbor. And so Jesus just gives him the latter half. You shall honor your father, not murder. And it's interesting that Jesus doesn't mention do not covet. That's weird. He doesn't mention the last commandment. Do not covet. You'll see maybe why Jesus doesn't put that in. But he shows only those that that he's to do with his neighbor. And so look at what this man says. And he said to him, Teacher! Notice he drops the word good because Jesus says, don't call me good. So he says, okay, teacher! I have kept all these things from my youth up. I've kept all these things, verse 20. I've kept them all. He's saying, I myself He's using it in the middle voice. I've kept my, I myself have kept all these things. I've avoided all the bad and I've done all the good. I myself have done this. And notice, it's as if he almost interrupts Jesus with his confidence about his abilities. Jesus probably may have continued talking about the commandments, but this man says, wait, 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 I've done all that. I've done all that. Don't give me the law. I've done all that. I've done all these things. This man does not reflect on his life. This man does not consider these words. He just says, no, no, I got it. I've done it. Don't, don't talk to me about the law. He's speaking confidently. He's speaking uh, boldly in front of Jesus. And absolutely, there is no introspection about the questions. He didn't even bother to say, this is kind of weird, Jesus. Why are you asking me about the law? I'm asking about eternal life. This man says, no, I got that. I've, I've done my good. I'm good enough. I'm a law keeper. I, in comparison to other men, I am good. And perhaps good enough. Now watch the unbelievable response that Jesus gives in verse 21 and following. Verse 21, Jesus says, or the Mark's gospel says, and looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, one thing you lack, 
Go and sell all that you possess and give to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. Now, I just have to stop because Peter, or Mark, is saying this particular phrase, look, look. It's repeated three times in this narrative. I don't know if you picked up on that, but he continually uses this word, look. And looking at him in verse 21, and then in verse 23, Jesus looks, and then in verse 27, the same phrase, look, is used again. That is significant. Because notice how this verse 21 begins, and looking at him, Jesus is looking right at the man. This word, look, is significant in this text because John Mark, who wrote this gospel, probably wasn't there when this occurred. The entire gospel of Mark was really a second-hand telling of Peter's gospel. Peter, the eyewitness that was within the inner three, was always with Jesus. And so Peter told this story to Mark, and Mark wrote down his gospel. And that's significant because out of all the people, out of all the disciples, it was Peter who received that piercing look from the Lord Jesus Christ when he betrayed him three times, if you remember. Remember after the the, the rooster crowed three times, Jesus looks at at Peter with that intense look. And Peter knows that look. And so Peter says, make sure you write this down, Mark. Don't miss this. I know that look. I know it when Jesus looks at a man with love. I felt that look. Write this down, Mark. And so it says here, And looking at him, Jesus felt a love for this man. Jesus looks at him intently. That word look is an intense gaze. It's a type of look that means to scrutinize. It means to look with intense affection. And so Jesus says, or it says, Jesus felt a love for him. He loves this man and now he's about to speak the truth to this man whom he he loves. He says to this man, One thing you lack. One thing you lack. One thing you lack. Now I can't even go beyond that verse because he he stops him right there. One thing you lack. Think of this. Think of what he just said prior to this. He spoke to the children and the children have nothing. And Jesus says, these children, they get to enter heaven. They have nothing. But this man has everything, but he cannot enter into heaven. So Jesus calls him out and says, there's one thing you lack. There's one thing you lack. These children have nothing and they're able to enter. But this man has everything and he cannot enter. He says this, go and sell all that you possess and give to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Jesus is making a contrast to this man in comparison to these children who had nothing and this man had everything. I, I, I have children in my home, as you know, and I, I love it when my children ask me for help. Particularly, Lisa and I love when our four-year-old asks us for help. She comes up and says, Dad, can you help? And I said, what do you need help with? Can you open this jar? Can you reach something for me? And I said, of course. I love it when you ask me for help. Now, some of the other children, they grow more and more independent as they get older. No, Dad, I don't need you to drive me anymore. I can drive. No, Dad, I don't need you to do this anymore. I can do it. There's more independence. And it it warms my heart when my children ask me for help. This is that kind of man. Instead of asking for help, he says, I can do it. I don't need you, God, I need to do something to get to you, God. And so Jesus is contrasting this man and what he lacks is that he is hanging on to something. He's hanging on to his possessions. And so he gives this man, there's something that you need to do right now. There's something that you need to do right now. And he gives him these four commands. Go, sell, give, and come and follow me. These four verbs. And one is in the present tense. The one in the beginning, go. That means this. When Jesus is presented, you must make a decision right now. 
There is no waiting. There is no, well, think about what I'm about to say. This is how Jesus does evangelism. He's not saying, well, let me tell you what you need to do. Let me see. Let me give you the law. And then why don't we do follow-up and then we'll meet later on in the afternoon for some coffee and then let's talk about it and then we'll make a decision and then maybe I'll pray with you. That is contrary to what Jesus is saying. He's saying right now, if you're on the fence, if you're wondering about who Jesus Christ is and if you've heard the gospel and that's been presented to you, Jesus is saying right now, right now, go right now. There is no waiting. Go. Sell all you possess and give to the poor. Do it right now. Act right now. And what's striking is this, is that you're to do it right now and then this is what will happen. You will have treasure, he says, in heaven. You shall have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. So there is something happen when you have treasure in heaven, you will follow Christ. When there is Christ, there is treasure. Christ is the treasure. Did you pick up on that? When, when Jesus says, you will have treasure in heaven, when you follow me, you will have true riches. You will have true treasures. And he's basically telling this man, will you exchange the treasures of this world for me? Will you exchange the grip of this world for me? Will you walk away from the grip of this world and its grip on you and the world's uh, uh, material wealth and exchange it for having me so that you can follow me? That's the question. That's the answer to this man's question. Are you willing to do that? Because there are some today that still are hanging on to something. They're still hanging on to something and that something may not necessarily be money. Maybe it's something because they have a something that they keep to themselves that no one knows about. Maybe it's a particular sin that they want to continue doing and they don't want anyone to know about it. They don't, they don't want to forsake that sin and walk away from it and instead come and follow Jesus. But Jesus is exposing this man's heart. Are you willing to forsake that? Are you willing to forsake that and come and follow me? Now notice how this man responds in verse 22. And at these words, his face fell. What a change. What a change. First, this guy's all excited. He's running. He's kneeling. He's confident. And now, complete change. As if the word of God pierced his heart and exposed him for what he is. A self-deceived man. It says, at these words, his face fell and he went away grieved for he was one who owned much property. Now look at him. This man who was once proud, so confident about approaching Jesus, so sincere, so full of zeal for wanting to talk about spiritual things, when they're confronted with the truth, they wither. They wither like a plant that's being choked by the, word, by the world and by the cares of the world. Kind of sounds like one of the parables that Jesus talked about, doesn't it? The four soils. Look at them now. Look at them now. And this should remind us that there are those that have a great interest in Christianity. There are those today that are just like this man, have a great interest in Christianity. There's a great interest in the church. There's a great interest in the effect and the emotions of being part of a, a community where they feel like they belong. There's an interest maybe even in the Bible. Maybe there's even interest in theology and how theology works and how theology can be compared to the systems of the world. There's interest in, in, in the teaching of the church. But just like this man, there's one thing, there's just one thing that this man and this person lacks. It's just one thing. Treasuring Christ. It's absent. This person could probably recite the Old Testament, could recite the law. He could probably memorize the entire 613 commandments of the law in the, Deuteron in the Deuteronomic law, the Mosaic law. But Jesus says, wait, 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 you, there's, you're missing one thing. You're missing, do you love me? Am I your treasure? Am I your treasure? And so this man, he, he realized, I, 
I, I can't. I can't. This world has a hold on me. And the reason why it says, for he owned much property. Now you're thinking to yourself, well, I, I can't be like this man because I don't have a lot of property. I can, I, I'm, I'm renting, you know? I don't even have my own house. I'm living with my parents or whatever the case may be. But the principle is the same. Is there something that, that you're holding on to? Is there something that you're holding on to that is gripping you, that is choking you from running to Christ and seeing Him as your true treasure? Maybe there's a blinder that is preventing you from seeing. Maybe it's your own sin that is preventing you from seeing Christ truly for who He is. And maybe there's some sin that you are coddling when no one sees. The Lord sees. He knows. That's why He specifically gives this man these commandments to expose his heart. Now notice what happens next after He says there's one thing that you lack. Jesus says in verse 23, the man departs And now Jesus, look at what he says in verse 23. He repeats this phrase, look. He uses that same word. Now Jesus looks around. Why is Jesus looking around? He's looking around him and and he says, and he's looking around in verse 23 and he said to his disciples, how hard will it be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? He's in a mixed group. And he's looking around and he's thinking, anyone else going to leave? Anyone else going to leave? He's basically saying, who is with me? Who is going to follow me? He's looking around and carefully watching as if after right when those words left his mouth, he pauses and he he looks around. Who's going to leave? Who's going to be with me? And then he says this to the disciples. How hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. Now, let me, let me stop. We have to be careful here. Jesus is not condemning wealth. He's not condemning those who are rich. Jesus is not promoting poverty. He is not promoting that poor people are good, rich people are bad. He's not saying wealthy people are sinful people and poor people are godly people. He's not promoting that kind of theology, that kind of doctrine. Instead, Jesus is condemning those who are gripped whether you're poor or you're rich, by the cares of this world, by the material things of this world. And that comes in degrees. Whether you are owning a little bit or owning a lot, are those things gripping you? And really, this text is a warning about the deceitfulness of riches. And he says how difficult it will be because there's something that we are not willing to forsake Think of what is it that you love the most. What is it that you love the most? I became a Christian. I want to be a Christian so that I can finish the sentence. I want to be a Christian so that I can have friends. I want to be a Christian because I have lived on my own for so long. I don't, I'm tired of being lonely. I want to be a Christian because I am, I, I, I'm so sad. I want to be happy. I want to be a Christian because I am looking for someone to meet and Man, the world is a bad place, so where else am I going to find a mate? In the church, because that's where all the granola people are. That's where all the wholesome people are, in the church. I'm tired of those dating apps, I'm going to go to the church. I want to be in the church because I need help with things around my house. What are the reasons? What are the reasons you want to be a Christian? And maybe the reason you want to be a Christian, the reason you have decided to become a Christian are all misplaced. They're all misplaced because there's still something that you're holding on to and Jesus warns this against you. If you do, it will be difficult for you. It will be difficult for you to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now watch what, how the disciples respond. It says in verse 24, and the disciples were amazed at his words. They're amazed. But Jesus answered again and he says to them, children, How hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And notice how the disciples respond. And not only are they amazed in verse 24, in verse 26, they're even more astonished. Their world is being flipped upside down. Their their theology of blessing is being absolutely torn to pieces. Because as a Jew, as an Israelite, they're thinking, 
wait a minute, I thought to be blessed was means to have a lot of stuff. Now you're saying to be blessed, I have to give away my stuff? Is that what's going on? Everything seems backwards. And so they're saying they're amazed and they're astonished and they're just confused. And so Jesus is saying it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The idea there, and I don't know if you, your Bible study commentary or whatever you're looking at right now, there's all sorts of different views on that, but just take it at plain value. The largest animal at that time was probably the camel, and the smallest hole was probably that of a needle. And so it's impossible for the camel to go through the eye of a needle. That's the impossibility of a rich man for entering into, the, into heaven. It would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And there's so many different views on that, but at, pl- at plain value, that's what Jesus is saying. And how do we know that's the meaning of what he's saying? Because in verse 26, notice what they say. And they were even more astonished and, and said to them, then, then who can be saved? I mean, if not this guy, who can be saved? And Jesus, looking at them a third time, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Basically, Peter was saying this. Peter was saying this. Wait a minute, if this guy can't be saved, I mean, he's rich. I, you know, uh, I, I look over our budget in the church and, you know, I look at the giving in the church. I don't know who is giving, so don't, don't look at me if I, you think like I'm inspecting your giving. But, you know, I look at the budget and I look at the, the giving and, and I totally know exactly how this feels. When someone comes along through and walks through our doors and, and I find out he's a doctor, a lawyer, you know what I'm thinking? Hey, you want to be a member? Well, you, can you, you want to be a member of our church? Because we, we, we have this remodeling project. Oh, and we, it would be nice for a doctor to maybe come along and maybe help us out. You know, Nick kind of needs a raise. You know, he, you know I, I'm thinking that way. This man is the perfect church candidate. He's a man of influence. He's a man of wealth. He's a sincere man. And Jesus just says, this guy can't go to heaven. He cannot go to heaven. He's got all, he looks great on the outside. He looks absolutely fantastic on the outside, but there's one thing that he lacks. He does not have Christ. He does not love Christ. He does not love me. He does not love me. And so that's what confuses the disciples. That's what confuses Peter when he says, then, then or the disciples, then who can be saved? Who can be saved? Who can be saved? And Jesus says, perhaps the most profound statement the profound statement he says in verse 27 looking upon them once again with inspection with those eyes that are just piercing at their souls looking at them intently and saying to them with men it is impossible not with God not with God for all things are possible with God what the disciples are falling into is the very same trap as this man they're thinking I must do in order to be saved. I must look good in order to be saved. I must accumulate wealth in order to be saved. I must be blessed according to human standards to be saved. The disciples were falling into the same trap and Jesus says, these blessings that, you, that men look at, that's not what's going to inherit salvation. Your good your ability to speak well, your ability to understand theology, your ability to explain doctrine, your ability to recite and memorize portions of the Bible, your ability and your attendance in the church, none of those things, none of the things will allow you to inherit the kingdom of God because the one thing that I'm looking for is, do you love me? Do you love the Lord? Not your love for theology, not your love for the intricacies of doctrine and theology, not for those things. Do you love me? Because what these guys are looking for, how can I? How can I enter into heaven? And Jesus says, listen, it's impossible for you men to be able to get to heaven. Man on his own cannot get to heaven. That's what Jesus is saying. No man can get to heaven. It's impossible for man to get to heaven. With men, it is impossible because that's the context. He's trying to show them you cannot inherit heaven. With men, it's impossible. Who then can be saved? This is where the good news comes in. 
Because in verse 27, he says, but not with God. For all things, all things are possible with God. God can save anyone. That's the nature of God. He can save anyone. That's the nature of God. He's showing and destroying their whole system of merit, their whole system of self-work. Jesus is crushing it. And Jesus may have been thinking of Genesis 18, where it says, when the angel of the Lord spoke to Sarah and says, is anything too difficult for the Lord? Or the angel, and at that point in time, I will return to you this time next year, and Sarah will have a son? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? If a barren woman who is old in her age, and I can give her a child, I can do anything. In Jeremiah 32, Oh Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Jesus is clearly saying there's nothing. There's nothing too difficult. With God, it, there's nothing impossible with God. Now the question you must be asking yourself, well then, how does God do the impossible? How does God do the impossible? How does God do the impossible? That's what we should be asking ourselves at this point in this text. When you read this, how then, God? Show me. How can you do the impossible? Well, the answer to that question is right here in the text. This is how God does the impossible. Go back to verse 17. Where is Jesus going? In verse 17, Jesus says, and he was setting out on a journey. He's going somewhere to a particular place. It says he's going on a journey. Now jump to verse 32. Look at where this journey will eventually lead him. Verse 32, and they were on a road, that same journey. This is the whole narrative taking us through this journey, on this road, going up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, significant place. This is where Jesus is going to do something. And Jesus was walking on ahead of them and they were amazed that those who followed were fearful and he again took the twelve aside and began to tell them what he was, what was going to happen to him. Here's how God does the impossible. Right here in verse, 30, verse 33. He says this, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and will deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit upon him and scourge him and kill him. In three days, he will rise again. That's how God does the impossible. That's how he does the impossible. First of all, notice Jesus says, the Son of Man. That's a title that Jesus loved to call himself. That's a picture in Daniel, in the scene of Daniel, when the Son of Man was approaching in clouds to the Ancient of Days, that there is one who is called the Son of Man at the right hand of the Father that is coming, that he is going to rule. And this Son of Man, this is Jesus' title for himself. This is what I must do. You cannot rescue yourself. So God says, I'm going to send my Son to rescue you. And he's going to come and notice what he's going to do for you. He's going to be delivered to the chief priest and he will die a death that you deserve. And notice what they will say to him. They will mock him. They will spit upon him. They will scourge him. And they will kill him. And here is how God does the impossible. After he dies, on the third day he rises again, showing that even death has no hold on him. Christ rises again. This is how he does the impossible. He raises his son. He raises the son. And we who are in Christ are raised to new life. This is how God does the impossible. He takes the dead. He takes the one who seems like there is no life in them and he says, I can give you life. I can give you life. You might be thinking there's no hope for you. You have committed too much sin. You have been so bound up in the world's sin and that there's nothing you can do and God says, I can do it. I can do it. There's, not, there's no amount of sin that you have committed that I cannot forgive. And Jesus says, I can do it. I can do the impossible. And the trap is this. I don't know if Jesus will forgive me. I've done too much sin. I've committed a great sin and I don't think Jesus can actually forgive me. I've committed the great sin. 
I can't even utter the words. Uh, people have told me what they've done. I can't even utter it here in the pulpit, but they have committed great sins. And Jesus is saying, that can be forgiven too. That can be forgiven. But I've, I've done this. It's horrible. No one knows what I've done. And you're thinking to yourself, with men, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Forgiveness of sin can be found. So Jesus says, Come. Let me be your treasure because if you follow me, if you believe in me, I have died the sin that you deserve. You should have been given over to the scribes. You should have been the one that they spat upon. You should have been the one that they scourged. You should have been the one that they mocked and killed. But instead, I took your place. I went on the cross for you so that you wouldn't have to. I took your place. I died for you. That's how I do the impossible. Because God is not a God of impossibility. He's the God of all things that are possible. That's where he begins. And now notice. Notice. Why would God do this? Why would God do this? Why would God do the impossible? That's the question that you should be asking. Why would God do that? Why? Have you thought about that? Why would God send his son, the son of man, to take your place? Why would he do that for wretched sinners like us? The answer is right here in the text. You want to know the answer? Because he's good. Who would do this? Who is good but God alone? Isn't that what Jesus is? Why do you call me good? There is no one good but God alone. How how do we see the goodness of God? How do we see how God is truly good? Jesus says, well, this this is how I'm going to show you. I'm going to give my life up for you. This is how God de- demonstrates his goodness. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the goodness of God. There is none good. Isn't he good? Isn't the Lord good today? Isn't he good to you? Hasn't he been good to you? And, and this, is, this is the good news that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that the sins that We should have died for, but he takes it on for us. Now notice the unimaginable reward. Notice in verse 28, Peter began saying to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. This is too much. We've done everything, Lord. We've done everything. And normally when I quote Peter, I'm always ready to laugh because he's always kind of saying something really bad. But here he's actually saying something true. He's actually saying something very truthful. And how do we know that? Because of what Jesus, how Jesus responds. In verse 29, look at what Jesus says. And Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, Amen, Peter. You're right. Amen. You have left everything, Peter. I know you have, Peter. I know you've left your, your business. I know you've left family. I know you've left your friends for my sake. And so Jesus affirms Peter in verse 29. And he says, Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left houses, who has left house, or brothers, or sister, or mother, or father, or children, or farms, for my sake and for the gospel's sake. Oh, but that he shall receive a hundred times as much now in the present age. And what will they receive now in the present age? Look at what he says. Houses. Brothers, sisters, and mothers, and children, and farms, and persecutions, along with persecutions. And in the age to come, what happens in the next age? Eternal life. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean, I'm going to have houses? Is is Jesus a prosperity gospel preacher? You're going to have more houses? Is that what he's saying? Because he says, if you... If you follow me for my sake, you're going to forsake your family, you're going to forsake your brother, you're going to forsake your father and mother and houses and lands and farms, but if you follow me, I'm going to multiply it a hundredfold. Is this seed theology? I just got XM radio on my truck and the only Christian channel that I hear is about this prosperity gospel and it's horrible. That's all I keep hearing about. Is that what this is talking about? Is that what this is talking about? Well, notice that's not what this is talking about. Because it says it can't be 
prosperity gospel because look at what he says, along with persecution, you're actually going to be persecuted as well. But instead, there's going to be a multiplying of your houses a hundred times. Now, what does this mean? I have a house. Like some of you, I have a house. I just have one. I have one. Where's, my other, where's the other houses, Lord? Um, I only have one set of parents. Where's the other parents? Where's the other mothers? Where's the other fathers? I have one older si- sibling, my sister, and I have one younger brother, my younger brother. I'm the middle child. I still have one brother and I still have one sister. What is going on? My house is the same. My family are still the same. What is going on? What Jesus is talking about is this. He's talking about that when you are a Christian, when you follow Christ, when you embrace the Lord Jesus Christ for what he has done for you and embrace him as your Lord and Savior and forsake the world, forsake the riches of the world, forsake the family who says to you, do not be a Christian, do not fall into that trap, remain a logical thinking, scientific atheist when you forsake that family and instead follow Christ, this is what happens when you become a Christian. You enter into a new family. You enter into a new family and you will have fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters that multiply. That's what we have today, isn't it? We have multiple fathers who act fatherly to us. We have multiple brothers, multiple sisters. I have a, two, I have a two-acre place that I can always visit whenever I want. It's called the Hunter Compound. The Hunter and Clark comp, and I can always go there whenever I want. I have Bill and Madeline Hunter who are like parents to me. I just went camping with them this week and love talking to them. They're like my father and mother, and I love talking to them. God has given the church elderly people to be able to be fatherly and give us wisdom, and he's given us children. He's given us multiplicity of families that we can share with one another, brothers and sisters, and that is a gift of God. That is a gift And he says, listen, this is the blessing of what it means. I know you're forsaken, but this is what you receive in return. This is what you receive now. It's not something you receive later. This is what you receive now. You receive the family of God. You receive them now. Will you be persecuted? Yes. Will you be persecuted for your faith? Yes. But you won't have to bear it by yourself. You won't be alone in your persecution because you have your brothers, your sisters, your mothers, your fathers to be with you so that in the age to come, you will spend an eternity with them and you are going to receive this great reward now. You're going to receive this great reward now. Why? Because God is good. Because God is so good. God is so good to do this. And Jesus concludes by saying, listen, your thinking about the kingdom is so wrong. It's so off. You think the greatest shall enter, but it's really the least that shall enter. You think those that look good on the outside, the guy that can come up with all the answers, the guy who seems to be kissing up to the pastor all the time, he's not going to heaven because deep down in his heart, there's something wrong with him. But there's that guy, that criminal that just comes into the church that no one wants to hang out with. That guy's probably broken in his heart because so much sin is in him. He's the one that God says, that guy, that's the guy who loves me. Because you know what the difference between that guy and that guy? That guy knows he's a sinner. This righteous man who beats his, who, who, who's like a righteous Pharisee, he does not. But that sinner, he says, I'm a sinful man. That's the difference. He's the one going to go into heaven. And that's, that's why the math of this is so off. And, and the disciples are thinking, who then can be saved? And so Jesus says this, in case you're still confused, Jesus says, let me confuse you some more with your thinking in verse 31. But many who are last... Or, but many who are first will be last. And the last first. The privileged aren't necessarily going to heaven. And the underprivileged aren't necessarily going to be prevented from entering into heaven. It flips our entire thinking because God is absolutely sovereign. God is the one in absolute control. God is the one who will open the eyes. God alone will do the impossible. God will, the one, will be the only one to save because God is is good. That's our God. And this is our gospel. And may you, dear friend, if you've not yet received the gospel of Christ, 
I, I, I warn you, do it now. Do not hesitate. Do it now. Do it now. Forsake the riches of this world. Forsake the sins of this world. Jim Elliot once said, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep in order to keep what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep. You can't keep these riches. Give it up. But instead, keep what you cannot lose, which is Christ. He is your true treasure. He is your true treasure. He is worth living for. He is worth forsaking the attention and praise of this world because he's good. Let's pray. Father, oh Lord, we are so grateful, God, that you are good. I don't know if we think of you as good. We fail to think of you as the only one that is good. Because God, you are the one who does the impossible. You are the one who offers yourself to us. You bestow to us a person who we don't deserve, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he does something for us that we don't deserve. He dies the death that we should have died. And he takes our place and all his righteousness, all his obedience, all the things that he did right falls to our account. And all the sin that we've committed falls to his account. And he dies in our place. That's impossible. But yet God, you say you do it because you are the God who can do the impossible. Oh Father, if there's someone here today who is still on the fence, wavering, call them God to yourself. May they do it now, God. May they do it now and bow their knee to Christ and embrace Him and see Him as a wonderful Savior, a wonderful treasure. And may they repent of their sin. May they do it now. May they do it today. And for those soldiers of Christ that are marching forward here today, I pray God remind them of the treasure that they have, this body of Christ, that they are not alone they have brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers who love them or with them that will bear their burdens, God. It is a gift from you because you are good. Help us to see that this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. transgressions he was crushed for our sins